listening on this Lord's Day. And as I understand it, this is the first time that you've been all been able to worship together again in one service. So it's, it's a joy to be with you and have my family with me as well. Well, yesterday I was with my oldest son at Rudy Mines. We were doing some mountain biking, and, and we were at the top of a hill. We were getting ready to go back, and I, I thought I would check my messages. And I saw a uh, text message from my, my mother who had been able to spend Christmas with us, and she was driving back to Huntsville, Alabama, so I thought she would already be home. She had left at about 10.30 that morning from Evansville, and she, I saw a text message from her. It was about 3.15 in the afternoon, and she said, we are not in Nashville yet, still on the road. The traffic has been, been pretty bad, and I didn't have to um, really ask why the traffic must be really bad. Was it, was it a wreck or, or what? I didn't have to ask. I just knew. And even to have an explosion like that on Christmas morning just reminds us that the world is not the way that it's supposed to be. So how can we faithfully respond I want to tell you today that we can faithfully respond through lament. The name of the message today is the provision of lament. It's not something that we hear preached on often, and it doesn't seem like a fitting Christmas text, perhaps. But perhaps you, like me, as you've thought back on this past year, this strange, weird year, somebody somebody again told me this this week, he said, it's been a weird year. I've heard that, I've said that, you've probably heard it and said it yourself. But our Lord invites us to respond in a way that it just doesn't seem natural, in a way that's probably unfamiliar to many, many people. To cry is human, but to lament is Christian. It's a good saying. Turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to Psalm 13. This is a classic and brief psalm of lament. But it helps us to be able to see in David, the psalmist, as he writes to the choir master here, we see that it's instructive. We see that in its subscription here. So he, was, he wrote it to someone so that they could learn and could pass on uh, this kind of worship, this kind of praise, this kind of prayer. Like all the psalms, it's meant to be sung. But I'll read it. Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say, I've prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Thanks be to God. So as we come to Psalm 13, we find one who is experiencing suffering, but it's of the internal kind. He's experiencing uncertainty about the future. This reminds us that as we come to the scriptures, they are realistic. And God's people have been here before. But at Christmas, we recall his faithfulness. As we have sung and as we continue to sing to a God who leads his people through uncertain times. 
in times of suffering. So I want to talk to you today about what is lament and how does it work in Psalm 13. So first, what is it? What is this thing anyway? I've used this word several times already. We know well, there's a book of, of the Bible called Lamentations, and I could be wrong about this, but I, I wondered, I, I had to look to see if this sermon or this text had been preached on Psalm 13 before, and I didn't see a Psalm 13. I looked on the church's website and uh, looked up the, the different psalms that had preached on. I said, okay, okay, I'm safe, and I put in the word lament, and I didn't see the word in there, so that doesn't mean it hasn't been preached on before here, but I just, okay, uh, data point there, and then I thought, I'll look up lamentations, and I didn't see lamentations in there, and again, there was nothing wrong with that, or that didn't raise any bells or alarms. I just thought, well, maybe at the end of this year, as we're in this Christmas season, in light of what the church has been through, in light of what the world has been through, this just seems to be something that we need to utilize, a faithful response to living in a fallen world. This is, this is a provision that God has given us. Did you know that about one-third of the psalms are psalms of lament? It must have been important for God's people to learn So this psalm tells us this. When we're struggling, whether it's ranging from just feeling a little bit out of sorts about something, or we are and find ourselves in full-blown emotional distress or pain of some kind because of just the realities of living in a fallen world, we are invited into God's presence with this language this type of language, to utilize this. And so, again, it's this, this one particularly is, is, a, is a good case study. And whenever you, can, when you think about the laments, you can't, can't think about it so much as like a systematic theology. Whenever you read the Psalms, um, it's not this very organized treatise. That it's, it's more raw. It's more messy than that. This is a prayer of just crying out to the Lord, help me, help me. This is where I am, and I don't like it. I'm in a place that's not good right now. So it's directing all of ourselves to him. It's bringing ourselves to him, which is not something that we naturally do. It's a lot easier to say, I want to numb out, and I want to go to some form of escape, or I want to just Forget that I feel this way. Make, give me, find me something that's going to make me feel better and relief. Instead of working through that and bringing it to God. I don't find that this is natural for me to do. Uh, I don't think that I'm uh, probably alone in that way. But it's easy to not want to talk about hard things with anyone much less, uh, and not, and we can treat God as if he's just someone that we're not sure if he's really safe. Maybe he doesn't really want to hear us complaining about our issues that in light of the global scope of uh, what's going on can feel small. So we can feel ashamed that we're struggling. But the Lord cares about where you are today. He understands that every one of you have brought in different things, burdens that are on your mind, even into this worship service. And we can be relieved and comforted in knowing that every issue that we face matters to God. And yet, as people that need God, we find that It's not just problems outside of us, but it's problems in us as well. Sin causes us to respond very poorly whenever we're in pain or whenever even when we're out of sorts. Uh, So as we come to Psalm 13, I was thinking about, you know, what's the when's the first time that I ever heard about this idea of lament or this concept? And I, I thought back about when I was a teenager, there's a certain singer, his name is Michael Card, and he wrote a song, and it's called How Long? And it's actually a 
pretty close paraphrase of Psalm 13. And I listened to it many times from the time I was a teenager, but I thought it was a little bit strange, though, out of all the things to think about, if you're going to sing about something out of the Bible, why this one didn't seem like a lot of worship music that I had heard growing up. It wasn't very happy clappy. Uh, and I wasn't really sure how to handle things like this in the Bible. It made me a little bit uncomfortable. But the more that I thought about it, over the years, I came to realize God's not uncomfortable with this, and the psalmist isn't uncomfortable with this type of of worship. These are some of the lyrics from that, from that song, a little bit of a paraphrase of this. He says, How long will you forget, O Lord? How long, how long? How I long to see your face, O Lord. How long will you hide? How I struggle with my thoughts, O Lord. How long, how long? Suffer sorrow in my heart, O Lord. How long will you hide? And he just keeps repeating, How long, how long? You won't even give an answer, Lord. Give me light, or I can, I can live no more. My foes rejoice when they see me fall. We have overcome, and now they call. How long will you hide? How long will you hide from me? How long till you set me free? Still, O oh Lord, you are so good to me. How long, how long? My heart rejoices how you set me free. How long will you hide? You're the Savior that I'm hoping on. How long, how long? How I trust in your unfailing love. How long will you hide? So we find that this psalm, like the Psalms of Lament, they give us permission in our relationship with God personally and corporately to be sad about things that are truly sad. And it shows us that we can praise God when we remember who he is, and his character. So how do laments work? I'm going to give you three, three words. Take, tell, turn. I'm going to work through this chapter. Two verses at a time, take, tell, turn. First, take. Take inventory of yourself. Look in verses 1 and 2. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? So the psalmist here is noticing that he's in emotional pain, that he is out of sorts. So take. So four times in this psalm, David says, how long? It's not a, it's not a, a question that uh, is requesting information because he, it's just a cognitive issue, is it? But he is seeking to connect as he is expressing his feelings to God. He can't see evidence of his care. Have you been there before? Have you been there this year? Have you been there this Christmas holiday? But David deals with it during, not after the crisis. He goes to the Lord where he is in this time. He's wrestling with his thoughts. He's got a troubled mind. I like the good translation from the Christian Standard Bible. It says, How long will I store up anxious concerns within me? Agony in my mind every day. How long will my enemy dominate him? So it seems his, his enemy is in this state of just perpetually beating him, winning over him. And the three players here, as we see in much of the Psalms, I think it was the Psalm uh, commentator, great Bible teacher Derek Kidner, who said, you know, oftentimes you see this in the Psalms, you see these, the interplay of, of the Lord, David, and his enemies who hate his faithfulness as they do here. And he says, like, Kidner says, like two charges in a battery, a positive and negative, awareness of God and his enemies' 
behind him describe most of David's life. Yet the issue here, as we see in verse 2, is he has sorrow in my heart all the day. He's struggling with depression. Uh, in, this, in this state, uh, this is, um, we, we don't know all the issues here that are going on here. We'll, we'll come back. We do have a hint. We'll come back to that in just a couple minutes. But it seems to him that it's a kind of spiritual depression because there's, it just seems to be indifference on the side of God. If God is real, if he really loved me, why isn't he breaking through? Um, he wonders, is God just going to be silent in the heavens? Are the heavens going to answer? And he's wondering about God's timing. He says, how long? You know, uh, we all know what it's like to be a, a parent uh, or, or a child, that uh, you're in a, a, uh, a car uh, trip with, with mom and dad, and you say those, those infinite four words that every parent bristles at. Are we there yet? I saw a meme the other day, and it said it had this cute little boy, scrunched up face, smiling, and it said, I'll just wait until they're getting angry due to traffic, then I will ask, are we there yet? How long until we get there? That's a good picture of much more serious, serious matters, isn't it? How long we have to, to deal with effects um, from this whole virus thing? Many of you would say, I'm just sort of over. I talked to a lot of people. I just, I'm kind of over this whole thing. It's understandable. Well, the father doesn't get irritated by us bringing our concerns to him. But there is something inside all of us, I'd say even non-Christians, that, that they even recognize that the world is not the way it's supposed to be. And there's a longing for justice, for wrongs to be made right. And so we were made for lament. To cry is human, but to lament is Christian. It's the Lord that takes us through our sorrows, through our sadness, and says, come to me. I understand. I understand perhaps more than you realize. So not only to, to take, take inventory of ourselves, by the way, uh, taking inventory of ourselves is is a discipline. It can be very hard to do. And guess what? This is something that we really need the Lord's help. We need the third person of the Trinity. We need the Holy Spirit to help us to know how to see the struggles that we have that might be laced with wrong responses that are not faithful. We do live in a culture that feelings are ultimate. So this is not a touchy-feely sermon. But on the other hand, um, if, we th if we think that emotions are something to suppress and not to pay attention to, we need to realize the Psalms call us to ortho, not just praxis, right doing, and not just orthodoxy, right belief, but those things should lead us to faithful feeling, right feeling, ortho, pathos. I, I, I heard a Someone I'd consider, a counselor I'd consider to be a pretty astute observer of human nature. And uh, he was talking, he was reflecting himself on ways that he had been affected by this COVID disruptive year that he's had and as, as, um, as he was looking back on it. And he said some things that I thought, you know, he does, this is helpful for kind of getting underneath some of, some of the things that, that kind of make us sad. Yeah, we are sad about losses, um, people that we know, but there are some more abstract kind of losses that we have as well. They just lack of not being able to plan for the, for the next year very well because we don't know exactly um, how our schedule is going to be able to open up. But he said this way, he said, this counselor 
said this, this is how it's affected him. So he's going to talk about how he has been believing wrong things. So I'm going to read a quote about what he's been functionally believing instead of believing the Lord of whom he believes in. But he says, This uncertain future, this madness of time, does not suit my penchant for predicting and regulating all the variables in the world that make me anxious. It's not like I have, a, I have a response of managing my anxiety. He said, I believe that the way to contain my anxiety that has led to my exhaustion, that has led to my irritability, that is wrapped in my grief for all that COVID-19 has robbed me of, is to reestablish my capacity to predict my future, to once again be master of my universe, to be like I was before coronavirus, as much as anything that COVID-19 has dismantled my hubristic confidence that I can control my future by fixing any problem that comes my way on my timetable may be one of the most prominent. And then he added, if only temporary. Let's let's learn to take inventory, asking the Holy Spirit when we feel out of sorts to show us um, as we are reading the scriptures and reflecting on his truth. Shine the spotlight in my heart. Show me ways that I'm responding here in the ways that I need you. And that leads us to point two. Tell tell God how you would like for him to work in you and around you. Look at verses three and four. And we see here the psalmist moves from feelings about God to his own circumstances. So now he's talking about what's going on around me here. Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say, I've prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice, because I am shaken. So we're not really sure exactly, as I mentioned a couple minutes ago, about the circumstances, the situation that he was dealing with. But we do see a clue here in verse 3. What is... What, is, what's, what do we see here? Light up my eyes, lest I, what? Sleep the sleep of death. He's worried about death. If that happens, he said, well, his enemy would gloat over him. He doesn't want his enemy to rub it in his face. He says, lest my enemies say I prevailed over him, lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. So in lament, part of it is telling God, we don't tell him in a way where we command him, right? It's a way of talking to God. He doesn't say here, because you have a, It's not about what I want, it's just your will. He asked God to work and change him, to work in him. We tell God about how we would like him to change us. We need renewal. We we need renewal now. We, We need renewal from him perpetually. It's a perennial need. So he takes inventory not only of what he is experiencing in that moment. Um, He's bringing that to the Lord, and he's, he's asking the Lord in humility here um, for the Lord to change him. Light up my eyes, because I'm afraid of death. Change me. Meet me where I am. Bring renewal to me. I saw this, um, I saw this film this past year. It's one of the greatest movies I saw. It's called uh, Greyhound. It has Tom Hanks in it. And it's set in World War II, and uh, it's, it's about uh, just how the, uh, the submarines are, are going across the Atlantic Ocean and uh, trying to get to, to England. Um, so it's transporting soldiers, and it's, a, it's all about... Um, basically U-boat attacks, U-boat battles with the Germans, and based on true story. And there's a a tagline of the movie is pretty interesting, and it's something to the effect of, 
the only, the only thing more dangerous than being on the front lines is the battle to get there. The more, only thing more dangerous than being on the front lines is the battle to get there. And I thought about that, and I said, you know, many times as, as a missionary, when we're living in Japan, we feel, you know, weird on the front lines here, advancing the kingdom, Christ's church in a dangerous place, and you can feel like you're a soldier. Um, so I often thought of that, but, but then, you know, you come back, and you think, and you realize, you know, there, there, there is also a battle Uh, So we can say, yes, we want to see God's mission extended. We want to see his kingdom advance. We want to know Christ, and we want to make him known, as I know this church motto goes. And yet there is a battle within us, and that is a dangerous battle. And we don't wait till we have it together, and we don't fall into introspection. This is not about (laughs) navel-gazing. But this is being able to be free to take honest looks at ourselves and being able to realize there's an unreached people group inside of my own heart. I have to constantly deal with my sin lest it gets the best of me and I don't look to the Lord. I don't bring my cares to him. And I go to the thing that feels a lot easier and that feels a lot more, makes me feel like my life's a lot more manageable. Um, But... This is, this is what relationship with God, personally and corporately, this is part of what it looks like. Again, as we live in a world, as we journey through the world, this side of the new heavens and the new earth. And finally, point three. So we, we take our inventory, we tell the Lord how we would like for him to work, but then we turn, turn our confidence away from perhaps how we feel, how strongly we feel, and our circumstances and our interpretation of what we need. Turn our confidence towards the Lord and turn it into a song for what he has done. Look with me at verses 5 and 6. We see that. For I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Again, Derek Kidner said, the energy for his faith is expressed here in verses 5 and 6. Those are the verses I just read. He knows, looking back, he will have a song to offer the whole way he has been led. When we come to the end of this year, December 31st, and then December 31st, 2021, And as you come to the end of your life, when you do, you will have a song to offer because you will be able to see the Lord who has been faithful to you every moment of your life, even when it was not apprehended or seen, the whole way you have been led. Be comforted. Be encouraged to look to him. Push back on your own tendencies to run from him. To look to other, to other things besides the Lord. So the psalmist here in verses 5 and 6 shows there's this progression that happens that he expresses his feelings and he, because they matter in the reality of his circumstances. And He's not informing the Lord as if the Lord needed to know, but it was this relational connecting. That's why he's doing it. Because God matters most to him. What matters most to you? We can know these things, but then we can really know these things. The illustration I use with my kids a lot, I heard this, I think it was, I heard someone say, someone said it, and I heard it back from John Newton, and, or John Owen, maybe someone said it before that, but he said it's like, you know that a, a he said you could look and you could see a, a, a tarantula tr- crawling up your arm, and you could say, oh, a tarantula crawling up my arm. That's a certain kind of knowledge, isn't it? But then it's another kind of knowledge to say, there's a tarantula crawling up my arm! You know, that's a right response, right? 
So when we remind our hearts who, who our heart boss really is meant to be, what he has done for us, it can lead us to sing because we're, we rejoice. There's not just sadness and distress, but there's rejoicing because there's reflection on the fact that the Lord has rescued his people. In the Old Testament, uh, salvation has to do with deliverance from enemies um, generally in a, in a physical way, also in a spiritual way as well. There's something in us that, that, that often thinks in people, uh, yeah, we could talk about spiritual rescue and spiritual salvation, but something physical would be really nice right about it, some kind of physical rescue. And then we come to the one who left heaven for earth, the one who, second person of the Trinity, joined himself with human nature to step into our skin, to become flesh, to enter into the sorrows and the suffering of a fallen world, but also to defeat the enemies of our souls. We find here that uh, the, the, the shift, he shifts from me to thee, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. I've trusted in your steadfast love. The word in Hebrew there is hesed. I love the description of hesed in the Bible. This was also from Michael Carty. He said, hesed, it's, it's translated many, many different ways um, from the Hebrew to the English. It's very, very hard to express that. It's faithful love. That's a faithful translation. Steadfast love. Hesed can be described this way. When the person from whom I have a right to expect nothing gives me everything. What has the Lord done for you? He's rescued us from our treason against heaven, us who deserve to be treated like the enemies of God. Listen to this passage. This, is, this has been a passage I've thought about a lot. I, I was thinking about it this past month and thinking this is probably one of my favorite passages to consider around Christmas time as we think about why the Lord came. I love this passage from Hebrews chapter 2. Now since the children have flesh and blood in common, Jesus also shared in these that through his death he might destroy the one holding the power of death. That is the devil, and free those who were held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death. For it is clear that he does not reach out to help angels, but to help Abraham's offspring. Therefore, he had to be like his brothers and sisters in every way so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in matters pertaining to God to make atonement for the sins of the people. For since he himself has suffer, suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. He loves us. He hears our struggles and cries. He will come to us. We can entrust ourselves to him. When we as God's people have some kind of dialogue within ourselves, as the psalmist has here, or with one another, God, are you there? Do you even care about what I'm going through? Let us recall quickly that God would show his care, his, his ultimate care as he alone would come to share in our human nature. And I'm going to improve the quote that I like so much. To cry as human, to lament as Christian, I would say it's better, it's helpful to remember also to cry as human, to lament as Christ. The man of sorrows 
who was well acquainted with grief came to be faithful to all of God's promises to reveal his steadfast love to us. To show us that we do serve a God who leads us through times of suffering and uncertainty throughout the ages. So may we respond with joyful singing to him. And if you don't know him, if you've never looked to him in faith, in repentance of your sins, trusting Christ alone for salvation, worship him alone today because he is worthy of all your praise. The incarnation of Jesus is proof. We may, ha- may, wait, may have to wait on him and we go through times of confusion and unresolved tensions in our life, but he is worth waiting for. Christ has come and he will come again. This is the kind of God we bring ourselves to today. So may we lament because we've been invited to do so because he is worthy of all our praise. Let's pray. Father, thank you for sending your son so that good Christian men can rejoice. All of this for us thy love hath done. By this to thee our love is won. For this we tune our cheerful lays and shout our thanks in ceaseless praise. By your Spirit, may it be so of us. May we praise you today for what you have done for us. In your name, amen.